my lifetime, I have had more than my share of paranormal activities and encounters. Uh, the series of events I'm about to share with you <clears throat> are to me the most disturbing and still manage after almost 50, 50 years to give me goosebumps. My question is, why does a seemingly normal house sometimes seem to yield to negative spiritual activity? Oh, there are likely many reasons, and that, but that's just what happened at the house I grew up in on Shreve Drive in Bridgeport, Michigan. Uh, most oftentimes, I believe it's the actions of the people that live there, but not everything can be, be that simple in this case, but some of it is. But let me tell you about it, okay? Shortly after World War II, my dad and my grandpa Morrison built the house my family was the first to occupy. One other man, John Hoover, and I don't know if this is of any consequence or not, um, he was a neighbor, and I believe he helped lay the foundation for the house. Now, as I recall, the house was always filled with love, um, save for my older brother, who was always at odds with one of us and had an abnormal contempt bordering on hate for me, and still does. So other than dad, mom, my sister, and two brothers, no one else had lived uh, in the house except my grandpa Cunningham, or I think he would have been my great grandpa Cunningham. He, however, died either before I was born in 1955 or shortly. There were a few unusual events early on. I, I recall an incident when I could not have been more than seven or eight years old. It involved my sister Roseanne and the brother who despises me. <laughs> my sister has no recollection of it, and I don't know about my brother because he quite simply just does not acknowledge my existence any longer. <laughs> As I recall, the incident happened very, very early one morning. It was still very dark. I'm thinking probably uh, 2, 3 o'clock. And the three of us were looking out of my sister's bedroom window, which had a view of our large backyard and of my dad's garden area, which in itself was quite large. And what I saw was like a column of flames with the dirt of the garden being kicked up as if something were lifting off, and there was a heavy thrust that was kicking all the dirt and sand and sticks and such up. And that was it. And I'm the only one who rem remembers it, as far as I know. But it was not a dream. It was very, very real. But I digress. There were, was often an uneasy feeling when alone in the house. Now, my sister noticed it. My mom did, too. We didn't uh, like to be alone there, though it was never really discussed until we moved to Oscoda many, many years later. And when I was young, my mom kept me out of school a lot. And, I mean, a lot. It got to the point where the school had to send somebody out to, to see why she was keeping me out of school. And I remember the ladies telling my mom, we expect this from somebody on the other side of the tracks in town, but not here. It's got to stop. <laughs> you know, she later revealed it was because of how uncomfortable she felt there alone. Oddly, though, when she kept me home from school, she would sometimes leave me and go next door to visit with my Aunt May Brennan. And as a young child, it seemed like I was left alone there for, for hours, though I'm sure it probably wasn't hours, but it did seem like it. And I remember despite being told to stay inside, I would open the, the door, close the inside door, and stand in the door frame with the outside door open. It gave me a feeling of security that I could get out of there if I wanted to, and I did that until my mom came back home. I often saw shadows, usually on the front porch, at that same door, but there'd be nobody there. And I never really felt threatened by them, just afraid because I didn't understand how they couldn't, how the shadow could be there and nobody else be there. And I remember a number of occasions my mom investigating that with me, and there was no one, just the shadows. And that's how things were until they got much worse in 1970, 1971. My oldest brother was married and he lived about six miles away and on a farm. And my sister had always been my best friend, was married and living in Florida where her husband was stationed at Pensacola in the Navy. My other brother, the one who has an abnormal contempt for me, was also gone and he was on his first of two tours of Vietnam. So it was just dad, mom and I, plus my little dog Penny who, was, who had been Roseanne's and she gave her to me when she got married and moved. And then my amazing Amazon parrot, Polly, who loved to talk up a storm. But one evening during supper, my dad had a heart attack and he collapsed under the table, but thank God he survived. But my whole world changed. 
Not as drastically if it would have changed if my dad had passed, God forbid. But it changed. And medicine was not as advanced then when it came to the heart, so my dad had no choice except to retire. Today, it might have been a simple matter of placing stints, and you'd be back to work in maybe a week or two, but not so back then. So Dad had always loved fishing, and the decision was made to move up north to Tawas or Escoda, where he could hopefully enjoy his retirement years, and my dad really deserved to enjoy those. He was on the front lines in, in Italy in World War II, and then he worked at Chevrolet Transmission in Saginaw, until his heart attack but so it was during that chaotic period that things got much much worse there were a number of other things going on which may have influenced what i will call a haunting but first i had been writing for a local newspaper for a couple of years on the history and the people of the township bridgeport where i lived and there was a television show at the time a daily gothic horror show called dark shadows some of you might remember it and uh it was wildly po a wildly popular show, and, and I loved it. It was insanely popular with uh, teenagers my age, young teenagers. And, you know, when you hear kids, who, or people who were kids then, talking about the show today, they, they always say, well, I ran home from school to be able to watch it. But I literally, I did. I ran home from school to be able to, to watch the opening role on that show. <laughs> so, anyways... It was wildly popular, and I wanted to do something that um, that copied it. So I wrote a serialized spin-off called The House of Evil, which took place in Florida, and the newspaper decided to publish it. And it well, second, I had a large collection of Dark Shadows paperback books and comic books, as well as famous monsters of Filmland magazine and Monster World. And I had a huge collection of, of comic books, not necessarily oriented to the occult, superhero, mystery, that kind of thing. Well over 2,000 comic books. I had one room in my folk folks' house that was devoted to my book collection, in my comic book collection. But this was not unlike many kids of my age either. Young boys and teenagers back then loved monsters. Young boys and teenagers today are monsters. No, that's not too, not necessarily true, I'm sorry. But, and this was probably, this was probably the main catalyst. The Jehovah's Witnesses entered my life. And they had seen my series, House of Evil, in the newspaper and decided that it was up to them to purge my tainted soul from the demonic influence. <laughs> they were strange in a lot of ways. They scared me into ending the story in the newspaper after only three installments and began trying to control every aspect of my life. Get this, every aspect down to trying to, to telling me how to wash myself down below as to not excite myself. You know what? That never occurred to me until they brought it up. <laughs> but you heard that right. They were that controlling and manipulative. Well, once they had me somewhat under control, they moved even further. Through their mind control methods, they emotionally forced me to burn all of my books and most of the comic book collection. And I wanted to sell the collection because it had significant value at that time. Some of them were really decent collector's issues, and now I would be very rich if I had those. But uh, they would not hear of me selling it. They said I would be possibly passing the demonic influence along to others. And so we had a, a trash burning barrel in the backyard, and they escorted me and my collection out to the barrel, had me pour gas on them, and light them with a match on fire. And, of course, the flames, you know, blew up, and according to them, it was the demons coming out of them, but to a sane and rational person, it was, you put paper and gasoline together, light it, what do you think's going to happen? <laughs> I was traumatized, to say the least. I, I truly was traumatized, because I was torn. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, they, they sowed in my mind the seeds of fear, and that I would have to be very careful. I did not let the demons back into my life because they would try. Well, you know, it was less than a week or two after the book burning that I was asleep in my bedroom, um, in my sister's old bedroom where I'd seen the flames out the window. And the bedroom uh, was toward the rear of the house and was directly across from the bathroom. And the bathroom light was always left on at night for me. And so my room was never very, really very dark. 
and I woke up to the sound of someone in my bedroom walking and shuffling. But clearly there was no one there. <laughs> and at first I was frozen. I was literally frozen in fear. You hear people say that, but I couldn't move. I, I, I couldn't move, but then I gathered all my courage and I bolted from that bed, ran out the door and slammed it behind me tightly. My dad must have been sleeping quite sound. Uh, he was on a lot of medications from, you know, because of his heart condition. But mom got up to see what the commotion was and I told her and she went to the closed door with me. And as she listened, she heard the steps and also the look on her face was a fear, and it was a look, it's a look that I will never forget. We left the door closed, and I laid down on the sofa in the living room. As Mom went to bed after a while, I, I told her to, because I knew she had to be up early. And the room was dark, and my fear of whatever had made the sound was quite intense. And I laid there for a while, and, and then I did something I would never done before. I grabbed my pillow and my blanket, and I went into my parents' room, and I laid on the floor at the foot of their bed where after a long, long time, I finally fell into an uneasy sleep. At that point, the house had already sold, and a host picked out and waiting for us up in Escoda. In fact, after that night, we only had a couple weeks left remaining in the house. But it seems as though every night I remained there was filled with fear and tension. I slept in the bedroom again. I never slept in the bedroom again, I should say, and I never even went into it to pack my things. My parents did it. In fact, that final light, as my brother and sister-in-law helped Dad and Mom with the remaining items to go on the trucks, I stayed out at their house along with my dog Penny and my parrot Polly. I don't recall if Dad was ever aware of my fear, but I do know Mom understood, as she experienced part of the phenomenon herself and had felt the presence in, a presence in the house for many years. And I don't believe I ever experienced that kind of fear again. And I've been in a lot, of a lot of paranormal situations, but I never felt that kind of fear. But even after almost 50 years, some years, many years, it still gives me goosebumps to think about those closing days of my life on Shreve Drive in Bridgeport, Michigan.